Hello and welcome to Talking Spirits Podcast episode 12, the final episode of season 1. After the last couple of episodes have all been in German, he is finally one in English again. And my guest today is the Portuguese psychotherapist and bassist Nuno Encarnação. I met Nuno about a year ago through the Portuguese singer Diana Silveira and we got along with each other really well and had lots of interesting online conversations. So it was obvious that I felt like it would be a great thing to have Nuno as a guest on the show. I'm very happy that he immediately agreed to do it. The conversation you are about to listen to was recorded on 17th of April and we are among many other things discussing Nuno's love towards the bass and towards music, the Portuguese music scene, how he came to become a psychologist, the psychological effects of COVID-19 and the political and societal situation in Portugal nowadays. We are hoping that you will enjoy listening as much as we enjoyed talking. Hi Nuno, welcome to the Talking Spirits podcast. I'm very happy that you are taking the time to be my guest today. Thank you Armin, I'm happy to be here talking to you also. Nuno, you are a bass player, but you are also a psychotherapist. But uh, since you happen to be the first bass player to be a guest on my show, maybe we start with talking bass. So I would like to know how did music come to your life and why and how did you choose to be a bass player? Music has always been a part of my life since I was a, a young boy. My parents, they always listened to a lot of music. We always had a lot of music in, in our house. Although neither of them was, um, was a musician, uh, neither of them played any instrument. Um, but we were always listening to, to music. Even when I was a young boy, I liked musical toys. I had a melodica that I used to, to try to learn songs and uh, experiment with sounds on it. Um, then at the age of six, I started to play the piano. I played, I, um, I had lessons up until I was eight years old, but uh, I had to stop back then because we couldn't afford uh, the lessons anymore. Um, then at the age of um, 10, I got a guitar. Um, and I started to learn to, to play acoustic guitar. I went to the conserv conservatory at uh, 11. Um, I didn't last that very long because <laughs> uh, they always uh, teach all those uh, technical classical things. But um, I wanted to, to play songs from the radio, the, the tunes that I, I was hearing. So um, I didn't have the patience <laughs> back then to, to rehearse and to practice and all that. Uh, so I, um, I just went to learn with some friends of mine to learn chords and that. Uh, then at about the age of, of um, 14, um, I bought a bass uh, because uh, I always liked the, the sound of, uh, of the bass. Uh, I listened to a lot of uh, music uh, back then, pop music. Uh, I listened to a lot of pop music from the 80s uh, where the, play, the bass was very present. You can uh, hear all those, uh, those bass lines. Um, so I always liked the, the, the sound of the bass. Uh, my brother always also uh, bought uh, a drum back then, and uh, we started to, to learn together how to play together. Then I got into bass lessons with a private teacher. I um, got into some local bands, uh, rock bands. Uh, it was the grunge scene here in, the, in Algarve in Portugal also. Um, even when I went to the university to take my course, my psychology course in Lisbon, I joined some local bands back then. Uh, had a band also that uh, even we, we recorded an album and we played all around uh, Portugal. I then, when I finished by my course, I started to, to work. And uh, at the time, I had left uh, my, my band. That I had back then, and uh, I started to concentrate uh, on working and uh, earning money and uh, buying a house. So uh, <laughs> the bass was uh, a bit left behind. I stopped playing uh, 
I didn't play uh, bass for around 10 years. Uh, but in 2014, a friend of mine um, that I used to play in one of my old bands, um, he invited me to play with him again. He said that he wanted me to get back to music and he really loved uh, when we played together back then. So I started playing again, and uh, after that, I didn't I didn't stop until now. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> music is always present in my life. You just said that you had the, like a long break when you started playing again. Uh, how was it? I mean, was it difficult for you to come back to it, or was it more like uh, riding a bike? If you don't do it for a long time and you go back to it, it comes back naturally. It was a little bit difficult because. Uh, you have a lot of uh, muscle memory uh, that uh, wasn't there anymore. I wanted to do some things and <laughs> my fingers just didn't, <laughs> didn't react to it. Uh, I had to, um, to restart uh, certain, certain techniques and, and so. But it, it was good because it, it gave me also a bit of a freshness. You know, because uh, sometimes when we do the same thing a lot of time, it's like, uh, okay, it's not new. We aren't learning that much. <laughs> so uh, it was a sensation of relearning, uh, rediscovering new things. Um, and uh, it took a little while. It took a little while. It, uh, eventually, I restarted to, to, um, to get back on business. <laughs> back yeah. On <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, uh, I think, I, I think uh, I've evolved. There are maybe back then I did certain things that now I can't do because it's different. Back then, I used to practice a lot of hours a day, you know, five, six hours a day. You were at home, you, you just went to the instrument and play and play and play. So um, certain things would, were easier uh, back then. I don't have that time right now. Uh, but um, in other ways, I, I think I... I got better uh, musically in the uh, not uh, being that when you're younger, you're like, oh, I want to get uh, the right chops. I want to play faster. I want to uh, <laughs> put a lot of notes, you know, <laughs> I want to put a lot of notes, as much notes as, as I can get in the, the music. And now I just try to, I try to play the, the right note. Sometimes I'm playing, I'm uh, recording, and then I go listening and I think, oh man, too much. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> Let's go back. Let's cut this and this and this and this. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I know the problem for sure. <laughs> but with, uh, with age, we get a little bit more peaceful. People who become a bassist because they love bass and they, they love the frequencies like you described it before, usually they have a certain connection, special connection to the instrument. And also I think that uh, this connection also shows in the character, you know, in the personality. So would you agree with me? And if yes, how would you describe it from your perspective? Yes, I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> Um, especially because uh, I know a lot of, of bass players and um, it's really uh, <laughs> it's fun to see how their personalities uh, manifest itself when they are playing. I know uh, some guys that are, I, I'm usually, I'm usually uh, a more uh, calm person. Um, I'm a bit more re relaxed in the, in the, in the way that I am, with, that I deal with, with things. And uh, I think that um, reflects in the way that, that I play. I'm not the, that bass player that likes to, to be in the front and likes to, to show off and likes to put a lot of, of notes and fast notes and things like that. But I know other bass players that are exactly the, the opposite. They like to, to show off, they like to be at front, they like to, to play as many as they can and uh, in, in the shortest <laughs> amount of time, you know. I totally agree that uh, the way that you are, the, the personality, your personality reflect in the way that you, in the way that you play. I know that you also love blues music a lot. Could you talk about the blues and what the blues means to you and why, why you have uh, such a connection to this type of music? Well, blues is essentially uh, a type of, of music that 
uh, demands a lot of feeling. <laughs> okay, how can we say? It's not that uh, first, it's not that, that uh, type of music that uh, demands you to, to play a lot. In fact, what I really love about the blues, it uh, helps you a bit back, just start slow, you know, last notes, <laughs> you just start building, you, you build the, the, the song. Uh, uh, the way the, the song um, evolves, you start building the song from, from there. Start slow, you less note, so the, the dynamics are, are lower, and you can go with the flow and just start raising the, the, the dynamics, putting more stuff on it, and just dropping again. You go with the feeling, you go with the, with the song, and the few, few types of music um, allows you to do that. In Portugal, um, we have uh, uh, a type of music. Uh, I don't know if you if you know. Uh, it's called fado. Fado, yes, yes, yes. Of course, uh, it's very it's very sentimental. It's very um, it's very bluesy in the in the core feeling, you know. <laughs> so yeah. um, it's easy for, for for me to connect to to the blues. Um, because I also connect with uh, with father with uh, the feeling that's uh, behind it. Uh, it's very similar. It's not the the same. It's very similar in the in, in the feeling that uh, lies the, below. How would you describe the, the music scene in Portugal and the situation for musicians nowadays? You have before <laughs> coronavirus and the, the, the present uh, situation. Um, well, Portugal is, um, I think, it is a little bit like, like Germany, in a way, that um, is a place where we have uh, a lot of cultures that come here and uh, they mix with, uh, with uh, the local culture. Um, here in Portugal, we have um, a culture, uh, an historical uh, past uh, with the colonies, Uh, with the Portuguese people, we we had a lot um, with the, the discovery travels. Um, we had contact with uh, many cultures, many places, and uh, those reflect in, in our local culture. Uh, we have here um, in music, we have a lot of African influences, uh, Brazilian have influences from, from Spain, We have uh, a lot of uh, mix mixtures of, uh, of culture uh, references, so um, that reflects a lot in the in the musical scene here in in, uh, in Portugal. Well, uh, we have a lot of of uh, of, um, of bands of people creating and uh, different uh, type of music uh, from uh, African influences, from Brazilian influences. From uh, even um, uh, American, uh, Spanish, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a big mix of, of, of influences. Um, and that uh, helps build uh, the character of uh, the local musicians because uh, many of us are very eclectic. You know, we play a lot of uh, music styles, we play a lot uh, of sound. We can adjust and adapt to a lot of, of styles. In Algarve, where we have a local scene, with uh, um, we're not. This is not a very big region, but there's a lot of musicians living here because it's a tourist area with uh, a lot of events. Um, the night here, the, the events at night is uh, is very very rich. Especially in the summer, so there's a lot of musicians here that are playing, that are working in bars, in the in hotels, in, in events, and uh, unfortunately, that uh, life, that musical life, now it's it's completely stopped because uh, no one plays, no one, uh, there's n no one working right now, and. Um, It's not a matter of, of playing music right now. It's not a matter of satisfying uh, the needs to, to make music. For some, it's a matter of uh, uh, survival. Some simply aren't working, aren't earning money. They, uh, their allowances are coming to, to an end, and they don't know how they're going to eat the, the next month. We aren't seeing the lights in the end of the tunnel. 
concerning the, the cultural events, we can see the light in the end of the tunnel concerning other activities, but um, the cultural events, the, the music scene, it's completely stopped. We don't know when it's going to open again. How would you see the music scene in Portugal also from, from the sense of the music business? Here, the, the, the musical scene is not very, uh, it's not very big. So there's, there, are, there isn't much room for certain artists to, to be able to play and uh, earn enough money for you to, to make original music get a life and earn a life with it. So most of the, the, the musicians, they, they play in uh, covers bands, um, they play in bars. Also, some of them play with some of those artists. It's not very easy for um, an original uh, artist to, to get through and uh, get to a certain point when he, where he can um, and where he can make a living of it just for making his own music when you're not in uh, central regions like Lisbon or Porto that are um, regions where you uh, the music scene the the producers and the, the promoters they all are uh, centered there When you don't belong to that area, it's more difficult for you to, to have your own project and um, go outside and so. And uh, also, uh, there aren't many Portuguese bands that uh, get outside of Portugal, um, mm -hmm. get into international, uh, in the international circuits. Um, sometimes most of the, the Portuguese artists, they Uh, going to in the international circuits um, when they, they, they play um, Fado or uh, New Fado into the world music uh, scene. Uh, but other bands, other projects, uh, they go outside to play with, with the local uh, Portuguese communities in uh, other countries. The artists go from here in Portugal to play to other Portuguese people in, the, in other countries like France, to Germany. As we have mentioned before, you are working uh, as a psychotherapist. So how would you explain your fascination with psychology? And what was the reason for you to choose psychology over music in terms of a career? Psychology has always been uh, an interest of mine. My mother is a social worker, social assistant, and she works in the social area. So I, I always had uh, uh, an influence in the, the social uh, um, issues. And always, I always had a certain curiosity in the, what makes people be what they, what they are, you know. <laughs> I was always that, that type of, of person that uh, all of my friends like to talk with and uh, when they were, wanted to, you know, <laughs> even before, you know, and uh, uh, they, they said that I was a good listener and uh, I gave uh, good advice, um, but that helped uh, build in, in me the, the, uh, that feeling that psychology was uh, a good Uh, learning uh, area and uh, the right choice for me um, in terms of uh, going to the university, having uh, a course and uh, having a, a profession um, future. Um, when I got into the, the university, um, I was more certain, although uh, psychology here in Portugal uh, is not a very safe Uh, professional uh, uh, path because uh, there are a lot of psychologists and uh, not many uh, work opportunities uh, but um, I eventually got lucky and uh, after I finished my, my course I eventually uh, started to, to work in the place where I, I work right now it's a um, residential care unit for, for children and uh, adolescents um, and from that, uh, I just started to, to make my, my path in, in the psychology. But uh, it's funny because um, when I was studying, uh, I was all, also playing at the time. And uh, eventually, my uh, 
how do you say my my thesis my end of course thesis uh, the work that I, that I made at the end of, of my course was about uh, psychology and music i even uh, i even released uh, i even um, got that that uh, that work and uh, published uh, a book it's called between silence and words psychoanalytic variations about music as i used the, the psychoanalytic theory to um, think a little bit about about music and uh, the, the things that work around it's not in the in a music therapy kind of uh, approach but more in um, the place that music uh, lives in our psychic life yeah there's a big connection between those two i think that's why i wanted to ask you also if you know the insights you won in your path as a psychologist did uh, have an effect on you as a musician it helps you connect more with uh, with yourself uh, and also music makes the, the other way because uh, music is the language of emotion and you can say with music what you cannot say with words so that's um, when we work uh, with uh, with people so when we try to help people uh, um, through psychology you're trying to work with uh, their emotions to, to listen to their emotion you're trying to uh, listen not only to what they're saying to you verbally directly but also what they're uh, expressing what uh, their uh, what their um, underlying uh, meaning what uh, what uh, below there and essentially music is that you communicate in a way that you don't need to to speak you don't need to talk you know and we when we are we are in a band and you obviously know that when we are playing uh, you can feel <laughs> where the other guy is going <laughs> feel where um what the other guy is asking in the uh, if he wants to to raise the the the, the dynamics of the music he wants to lower it if he wants more mellow feeling you even can feel how the people how the the person is there that day by the way that he's uh, he's playing you know both these areas uh, in interconnect in this uh, in this way if, uh, at least for me that's uh, how it makes sense if you talk about um your line of work you you mentioned that you are working with uh, with kids maybe if if you if you like you could share something about what you do exactly and then i would uh, like to ask you how do you perceive the situation of a young person in the nowadays society where everything is so crazy and fast and where so many impressions and 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 challenges which are posed to us every day I work in a res residential uh, care home for uh, children and adolescents. So um, these children and adolescents, they need to be taken off their families because something happened there. So they couldn't um, live with their families anymore. And they are uh, taken from the, um, those places and they are transferred to this uh, to this unit um that's a residential unit um we have up to 18 18 uh, young people living there from children and adolescents so they go there and they live there with us uh, and we try to to work with them some of the issues that uh, led them to to be there um and we try to to help them cope with uh, all those feelings all the, those emotions and uh, we try to find um what we call uh, new life projects that uh, eventually will lead for them to to leave the, the this institution this re residential care uh, facility and these um life projects can um, be uh, the return to their um, original families um, if those origin, original families uh, can work with us uh, through the, their own issues and can overcome the difficulties that um, uh, created the conditions for the children to come to, to the place where, where I work 
And if uh, we can overcome those difficulties, the, then the children can uh, return to their homes and um, eventually have uh, better life opportunities than they had uh, before they, they went to, to, um, to our institution. If those children cannot uh, return to their families, then we try to, to arrange other solutions that can uh, pass uh, by um, an uncle, a, a grandmother, a grandfather, uh, an older brother, if they have uh, their lives more organized, or uh, even eventually go to, to adoption, or with some of the older um, the, the older uh, adolescents, we can uh, try working with them uh, to try to help them autonomize themselves and have other life opportunities that they can build without relying on their, on their own family. I try to um, to help all these uh, all these young people um, to have uh, a different um, course of action um, than the the one different from the one that uh, eventually led them there. Concerning the the nowadays demands on on the young people, uh, not only on this specific type of group that I work with, but uh, eventually more general. Uh, I think this uh, is a very challenging time for, uh, for all of us. First, one thing that uh, I feel is that we oscillate between uh, two opposite types of, 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 uh, of working. Um, at one side, we give a lot of uh, freedom for uh, for some of our young people. Uh, freedom to go online, to, to access information, to um, be with other uh, other person. That's uh, a sense of freedom, of uh, not just freedom, but uh, eventually some lack of limit. You know, it's like we can do anything that you, we want. But at the other time, especially the the, the parents. Uh, they have the, all these protecting movements towards the, the young people that um, also keep them uh, in some some sort of a uh, dependent state um, that balances this uh, sense of uh, I can do anything, but at the same time there are a lot of things that I can't do. Young people feel they 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 have uh, less limits. Than, before, than the, the generations before, but are much less uh, autonomous by itself. They have less uh, competences to to choose, to decide, to make more uh, fundamental uh, decisions uh, in things. So this is a, a problem. We have young people that are confronted uh, with uh, the openness of choices before them, but they lack the competence to make uh, better decisions because they don't have uh, the, that practical freedom to make the decisions by themselves, to learn from, uh, uh, from uh, their own errors sometimes, um, and uh, that eventually uh, raises a lot of challenges. We are now in the midst of a global pandemic and it's, at least in our time, it's a very unprecedented situation which has never been here before. And so my question would be, how would you describe the effects of such situation from a psychological point of view? Uh, from the first, first point, we, we've, we've seen here many stages of uh, of reacting to, to the situation. First, um, we saw a lot of people minimizing things, uh, denying, denial um, was one of, uh, of the reactions that some people uh, made concerning these uh, this, uh, present events. But then uh, after denial came uh, a lot of fear. So that fear um led to to the building of uh, internal anxieties that um, obviously uh, led to people having trouble sleeping um feeling uh, anxious uh, during the day uh feeling uh, 
uh, a lot of, of symptoms that uh, were mixed in their minds and uh, led them to believe that uh, they were sick in some kind of way. Uh, so this anxiety eventually uh, was good in a certain way because it led to a lot of uh, protective behavior. But uh, obviously, uh, when um, it started to grow in certain, in certain peoples, um, obviously it led to other types of, of problems. And uh, this eventually started to happen more, more and more. Thinking, thinking globally when the, the, the confinement started to be the, the rule, the, the, the overall rule here, people started to try to, to adapt to, to this new type of life. Uh, it's, not, it's not easy, obviously, because uh, uh, when you're confined to a small place, uh, eventually, you start to, to feel more feel more anxious. Uh, sometimes you start to to um, think think more of uh, the things that can uh, can go bad and can uh, the problems that you and you have in yourself in your life. Not only concerning the, the corona, but also other type of problems. So there's also the risk of evolving to to depression. Uh, and uh, this type of, uh, of feelings, but uh, um, eventually we need to work on um, types of uh, of ways to to occupy yourself physically, uh, mentally, um, of organizing your day, also, uh, mm -hmm. so that you can cope with these uh, long periods of of, uh, of being at home. And as a psychologist, with the people that I work with, we try to 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 provide that type of uh, organization, of daily organization, of uh, daily schedule to to do so. In the institution where where I work, we try to do that with the with the children and young people that we have there. Uh, I also try to to support the, the staff. Very important because uh, the people that work with these children. Also, they need to, to be taken care of, they need, need to be supported, they need to be helped going through these, uh, these phases because uh, uh, they need to be available for the, these children, emotionally available for these children. Also, a part of my work is with the, the, the staff to, to help them, them cope with uh, the demands of working in this current uh, situation. And also uh, their own personal feelings and their own personal um, worries. Let's talk about politics for a little bit, because for the last couple of years, there's a very alarming tendency in Europe, which can be observed, meaning that the right wing parties are on the rise. What we hear in the news in Germany is uh, that this is not the case in Portugal, which would mean that. Uh, Portuguese uh, political establishment has found a way to deal with this problem in a different way than other countries do. Would you agree with this? And if yes, what can you say about it? What, what's different in Portugal? I wish that was true because um, we still haven't had a major uh, rise in the, in the populist political area. But so we are seeing now um, that the, 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 the main populist uh, uh, party here in Portugal is getting a lot of attention and uh, a lot of people, especially uh, because um, this, this type of movements, they, they, they start differently from uh, what used to be the, the, the political uh, space or the polit political scene. Because... Um, the political, the, the typical political space is the media, you know, it's the uh, television, is uh, it's the, the, the newspapers, newspapers, radio, and um, the, these these new movements they start in other type of of, of media, starts online, they start on the uh, social network, and uh, on those social networks. Uh, unfortunately, we are seeing a lot of, uh, of people uh, manifesting openly right-wing uh, type of views uh, and right-wing 
uh, type of uh, thoughts and all that. Um, people here, um, I think this is, this is global. Everyone thinks that the politics uh, are only concerned with their own interests. Uh, they're only concerned with uh, getting money or getting positions or getting power to the people of their party, to their relatives or so. And this uh, has uh, been the, the, the fertile soil for this type of thoughts, this type of, of uh, um, political speech to to get uh, and start uh, throwing seeds and start to grow uh, among many, many people. Um, I, I know people, some of them are, are my friends, that uh, share some of those views because uh, it's easy to, to beat the, this politician in uh, that area. It's easy to say that the government doesn't doesn't work for us. It's easy to say that uh, oh, we pay too many taxes and the taxes are stolen by the government and they give the, the money to the companies that, uh, that, uh, that they want uh, and all of them are taking uh, what, what we work, uh, what we earn. It's easy. It's easy to say that. Um, it's not so easy to, to see that certain decisions obviously uh, need to, to be made. Uh, not everything can be offered or, or provided. I don't, uh, I don't want to make an apology of the, the politicians because I think that they uh, have their own share of guilt in all that it's happening now. Uh, but um, when, when we mix this, uh, these feelings, when we mix these ideas, when we mix these uh, representations of the, 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 the classic uh, political parties as uh, bad, bad, uh, uh, bad groups of people, um, when we mix this with the social network and the, the diffusion of fake news, uh, and uh, people are more willing to believe in conspir conspiracy theories and mm. uh, what uh, you know, what uh, fake news uh, sites are providing. Then uh, they they are more inclined to believe in that than in uh, certified or fundamented uh, sources. Then it's easy for this this uh, this uh, type of thoughts to grow. Uh, but here in Portugal, we had. Um, a dictator, the, the, the dictatorship uh, uh, type of government for many years. Um, and we still have uh, in ourselves this uh, uh, notion that uh, certain types of uh, political ideas are, are not good for, for, uh, for the people. Although um, this is also, this, this is a, um, a crisis for the political system but it's also a crisis for the, the, the more classical political currents, you know, right, uh, right or left. And the, the, um, the left wing, let's say it is, the more uh, concerned with the, the social issues, uh, the more concerned with the, 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 the social uh, questions. It, it's also going through a crisis right now, an identity crisis. I think that as a, as a society, we have reached um, a certain state of uh, well-being that has eventually taken off some of the issues that uh, the left wing usually breaks out. The left wing has now started to, to, to become involved with cer certain type of issues that are also important, but uh, are not what uh, most people um, are concerned with uh, in their uh, daily life. The, the minority uh, things, uh, um, and it's important, it's very important that it, these issues are approached and uh, are, are worked through. But sometimes the way that these issues are being brought to, to discussion, um, also uh, presents the separation between between groups. You know, this opposites also allows for uh, an opposite discussion the, and creates fractures that also allow for this uh, right wing to grow. 
the the political discourse it's getting more extreme right now although in the 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 constitution of the the the, the government in the 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 assembly the the with the, the deputies uh, and and so um we don't see that reflected but uh, for the first time in many years we have one party that's from the the, the right wing that is represented in the parliament for us that we have a, a culture of uh, revolutionary ideals from the 25th of april it's a very important date here in portugal that represents uh, us coming out of the, the dictatorship uh, represents uh, ideals of freedom of solidarity of orientation for a common uh, common well-being for us in portugal to have for the first time uh, right-wing uh, uh, openly declared right-wing party represented in the parliament it's a, a very important uh, historical uh, first step from the, the things that we've, we've seen and from the things that i've been seeing here and uh, been uh, experiencing on social on social media um, i think that the next election elections will show a growth in this uh, this type of part i wanted to ask because you mentioned the uh, the uh, dictatorship of salazar what do you think like uh, how this is relating to the situation now because usually Uh, one would like to think that uh, we learn from history, but in many cases, uh, it's just sadly not the case. And, and so do you see a relation between the situation right now to, well, the, to the past? I see a relation. Unfortunately, history uh, needs to be lived through. Uh, it needs to be kept alive. Uh, and the, the, the right messages needs to, uh, to come through. What I've been seeing here in Portugal is like a, a, a cleaning of the dictatorship history, you know? Uh, it's a whitening of, of that, uh, that past. People tend to compare uh, the days of the, the dictatorship as uh, days where there was no corruption. You know, there's a myth involving Salazar that says that he was uh, like a, a pure politician. He made uh, an economic, uh, an economic miracle. When we when we pass from the the monarchy to the republic, the first years in the the the, the first uh, 20 to 30 years of the the 20th century, the 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 first republic, as we call it, it was a mess. Politically, it was a mess. Um, socially, it was a mess. Economically, it was a mess. You know, and it eventually it led to our um, our country to go bankrupt. Uh, and Salazar was the Minister of Finances um, in the, in the, the last government of the, the first monarchy, um, uh, first republic. Sorry, um, and uh, he laid uh, a plan, uh, an economic uh, plan um, in function in, in the country that eventually led Portugal out of the, the, the bankruptcy. Very strict plan. Uh, and, and he gained a lot of power, a lot of power, a lot of political power back then. And it was the, also the time where it's when the, the first uh, dictatorships in Europe started to, to emerge. Franco, uh, Mussolini, Hitler. Um, it was a time where uh, this, all these strong political leaders started to appear in the, the European uh, history. And Salazar was, was one of them. He gained a lot of power because he took over the, the, the country's finances and eventually uh, led to, to, to the recovery. But um, in this miracle, Financial recovery is what um, helps build, build like a, a mythical representation of Salazar as a great politician, as a, a great uh, uh, economic uh, genius. All that he made was the, the, the economical politics uh, of uh, an accountant. It's like we need to uh, 
puts all the money to keep all the money that we can to ourselves gets uh, most money and spend the least of it in uh, simple terms this was the salazar's economical uh, politics in the first years this was important and eventually led to portugal uh, getting out of bankruptcy but in the, uh, the, the 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 rest of the years this was not good there was a lot of, of, of poverty here in Portugal in the times of Salazar. There was uh, like uh, an elite uh, administrative elite uh, that worked for the government that had a lot of rights and that, and that believed themselves to be superior. Uh, and then the rest of the people, they lived really bad. My wife's father, he only had a pair of shoes when he was about 10 years old, was the first pair of shoes that he had. He only wear it to go to, to church or uh, events uh, or so. And this was uh, uh, how it was back then. This was how it was in, in, in the time of Salazar. And we need to, uh, to, to see one thing, one thing. Back then, Portugal was a colonial empire. Back then, Portugal was not only this little place we, we had uh, colonies in Africa, we had colonies in India, uh, we had uh, Macau in, in China. One of the things that Portugal as a country doesn't have, obviously, is the access to, to, to prime matters like uh, oil or, or uh, coal. But that, that, uh, we had all of that in the, in the colonies. We had Angola. Angola is uh, one of the richest countries in matter of oil and uh, precious stones and uh, minerals in, in Africa. How is it that with such an access to a big market, such an access to, to, to resources, you know, we had such a poor country. All, those, all that, that richness was not invested. And we Right now, we are paying the failure of the economical politics of the, the years of Salazar. Also, other, other myths come around. Oh, he didn't, he didn't, he only, uh, he was poor. He only uh, received a minimal wage or so. He didn't earn money, but he lived as a king. Other, other myths, there was no corruption in uh, Salazar times. It's a huge lie. Most of uh, the corruption uh, system that we see nowadays was created, was uh, made in, the, in, those, in those times. Maybe Salazar wasn't corrupt, but he didn't need it. Most dictatorships have an, an administrative uh, monster below them. Sadly, well, you can come to the conclusion that it's always the same with this type of things. That's, that's exactly where uh, these new right-wing movements are, 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 are connecting. People are insatisfied. People think this is, is, uh, this is always the same. It's always the same problems. These guys won't, aren't going to solve our problems. Then there comes another guy that says says exactly what you're saying you know they um take what uh, the common people say they take what the common people uh, concerns about they um feed on their frustrations and they build on it they show they they say okay i'm like you i uh, i feel the same um those are the bad guys uh we are the ones that are against the bad guys. We are like you and we are going to, to, to change all this. We are going to put all those bad guys in, in jail. We're going to take them out and we're going to make things right and we're going to provide for everyone and we're going to be the best, the best ones around. Yeah, we can just hope that people are willing to be conscious about what's really happening, or, like, or to, to really go into things and inform themselves to, to understand what, what's really happening and hopefully to come to the conclusion that th these type of politicians or parties are not the ones who, are, who will bring uh, prosperity and peace in the end. As you mentioned earlier, you are from the Algarve. 
And it's a region in Portugal which is very famous for the beauty of its nature. That's why people from all over the world like to come there for vacations. You have been you, you have been born and you grew up in this region. So how would you describe it from your point of view? And how would you describe your personal connection to it? First, I think that the the, the most important connection that, that we feel here in Algarve is, is uh, with the sea, you know, with the beaches, with the, with the sea. Uh, you have um, all things uh, near each other. Uh, you don't need to go uh, very far to 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 go to 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 a countryside. You don't need to go very far to to go to a beach. You don't need to. You um, things are are are, uh, are quiet here. The, not uh, that much problems. Um, when I was young. There was a time, obviously, when uh, when you're younger, you like to, to go out. You like to <laughs> go out with your friends, go into the night, have some drinks and all that. And obviously, in the summer, this just goes amazingly crowded and it's uh, super wild. And the nights are really, really wild. So it's very, it was very, very good to, to be here and meet all kinds of people because One of the things that is interesting here in Algarve is that uh, we, uh, our, uh, we the local people, we end up meeting people from uh, many different countries. So we could, could go out in, in the night and um, uh, meeting someone from England or someone from Germany or someone from Holland or so. So um, we could uh, connect and interact with uh, many different uh, types of uh, persons from different cultures. And one thing that's really interesting here in Algarve, in Algarve is that we have a lot of, of um, foreign co communities here, not only um, uh, immigrants from, uh, from uh, the, the, the colonies, the, the former colonies, Uh, from Africa um, or from uh, Brazil or, or so, but we have uh, people from uh, England, communities from uh, English people here, we have uh, communities of people from Germany, from Holland, big community from Holland that uh, lives here in Al Algarve. Um, there's, uh, there are building communities here of uh, French people also, uh, from Finland. Um, there are a lot of people that... Um, have chosen to come here and uh, have uh, bought homes here. Uh, some are secondary homes, other are um, their uh, res residences here in our Algarve from now on. And um, these communities also have a, a sort of uh, the, um, cultural uh, media medium that uh, also is interesting to, to see uh, how it uh, influences uh, the Algarve in, in itself. Um, we have, uh, uh, concerning tourists, we have uh, uh, different types of tourism here in Algarve, which is also interesting because you can have uh, more uh, beach tourism with all those uh, hotels uh, near the beaches and all that. Uh, but you also have more rur rural tourism in the interior. Um, we have um, places here in the interior that uh, is more connected to, to nature. Um, that's uh, it's really really nice to, to be at. And we also have other types of beaches that are not so well known. For me, are my preferred ones, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> not all the other people. <laughs> But you have you have uh, the South Shore, you know, and then you have uh, um, the South uh, Southwest Shore that um, uh, starts in Sagres and starts to rise up uh, up north. And that South Southwest Shore, it's amazing, you know, in the in the, uh, the nature, uh, the landscapes, it's incredible. The sea is much cooler, <laughs> much cool, uh, cooler than the, the, the South Shore. Uh, and also it's braver, but uh, it's very good. And for the people that like to surf uh, and do that, it's um, you know, the best beaches are, are, are there. And for those that like to, to see nature, to see landscapes, to do some trekking, 
because you have uh, all this uh, this path that uh, goes through the shore. It's uh, an amazing place to 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 be at. Yeah, but but so you never considered going somewhere else. I mean, you said that you went to Lisboa for studies, but you never considered to live uh, in a different country, for instance. Uh, I've I've considered that I've considered that before, especially when <laughs> when you're younger and you're starting to think of um, different uh, professional perspectives. I uh, I thought of going to to England to study there to to make a PhD in the, in psychology because uh, when uh, I like very much some of the universities that they have there, but. Uh, It's nice to live here. I like it. It's easy going. Um, I like uh, the things that you can do here. You know, uh, sometimes we feel we are a bit far from uh, from certain things concerning the industry. That's one of the things that uh, we we a lot of times we 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 are not well provided here in Algarve. If you think about the future for yourself, do you have a certain, like, let's say, do you have any special dreams or wishes or ideas which you have not realized so far? Obviously, I would like to travel a lot more. <laughs> That's one of the things that I would really like to do. And I miss, you know, yeah. go, go traveling, meeting places, meeting people. Um, that's uh, really one of the things I would really like to, to do so. I would really like to, to keep evolving in a musical way. Um, there's a project that I started, uh, I became a part uh, you know, last year, that uh, I'd really like for it to, to grow a bit more. Um, it's essentially Portuguese music, uh, more uh, a sort of a novo fado. Um, and uh, we we would really like to to take it to to other places, get into the the world music scene, and uh, we can uh, see a bit of, a bit of the world and take some music to to the world. Some some uh, read more, <laughs> love more, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I also have uh, I also have uh, another hobby, another passion. That I haven't told you so, but uh, I. I can I can share with you because I, I make bonsai. I I these days I've been working a lot of my bonsai. I have a lot of free time, you know. <laughs> and I, yeah. I have home, so I have to take care of, of those little trees. And also I like to to do this and uh, to use this uh, as a way of uh, creating in another in another area, you know. <laughs> we have talked many things, and we are now approaching uh, the end of our conversation today. Is there something which you would like to share with our listeners to end the conversation? Everyone stay safe and everyone keep positive. This isn't, uh, it's funny because we, we were talking about populism. We were talking about the rise of all these extremist ideas and all sorts. But now we live a time when the, more than ever we need each other. Cannot be with people, but we need to connect with people. We need to to feel close to uh, to other people. We need to feel that we're not alone. Uh, we, we need to feel that this is uh, global. It's not a matter of being black, of being white, of being Chinese, of being English, of uh, being Muslim, of being uh, you know. Uh, Buddhists, uh, of being uh, American, of being Portuguese. It's not a matter of this. We're all in the same page here. People always talk about differences. Differences are important because difference make you who you are different from me, you know? Always, and also makes you uh, um, a rich person because you have things that I don't have. That's accepted those differences and accepted those differences can make you an important person for me because you bring things that I don't have. Many of those things may be things that are lacking in my life. I agree, and, and we need to see differences not as a problem, but rather that as an advantage. And it's good to, to see that it really works. So I would like to say thank you very much for taking the time and for the great conversation. My best wishes to you and to your family, and let's hope we can do this in real life 
sometime soon. Okay, thank you, Armin. It was a pleasure to talk with you also. Okay, thank you. You have just listened to Talking Spirits Podcast, episode number 12, with Nuno Encarnação and Armin Alic. Since episode number 12 was the final episode of season 1, I want to take the time and say a huge thank you to all of the great people who took the time to be my guests and who were so honest and open in the conversations. Also, I want to send a huge thank you to all of you who have been listening so far. I really enjoyed the ride and I learned a lot in the process. As I'm just preparing season 2, I'm looking forward a lot to more amazing guests and to stepping up my game a little bit, so I will be able to present to you even more interesting and better sounding conversations sometime soon. As usual, you can listen to all episodes on www.talkingspiritspodcast.com where I also will be posting updates and details about Season 2 very soon. Stay healthy and safe and feel free to reach out if you want to talk. Bye!